Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon. Welcome, welcome. I'm here, one of my writers in this case, George. Thank you so much, George. He's written me a script. Oh, we're off to Hong Kong. George is like, I feel like he's my man in Hong Kong because he lives in Hong Kong and he writes all these crime cases from Hong Kong that people love. And I love hearing about them because they're like, they're way less covered. Anyway, today's is uh, Cho Po Ko, Hong Kong's devil cop. Uh, if you're new here, First of all, a very warm welcome. Second of all, I'm here. I've never read George's script before. We're going to read it together, dear listener, dear viewer, if you're on YouTube. Hello. Like that video. Click that subscribe button. All those good YouTube things. And uh, let's just jump in, shall we? From the outside looking in, Choi Poco was just an ordinary police officer. He wore the uniform with apparent pride and patrolled the streets with seeming diligence. As far as anyone could tell, he was absolutely the model of a reliable and well-polished cog in the machinery of Hong Kong's law enforcement. But this devoted professionalism was but a facade and a chilling reality lurked underneath. For Poco was no ordinary officer. This man was sworn to uphold the law, and instead became its most terrifying transgressor. He was not the protector that he had pledged to be, but a wolf in sheep's clothing that used his uniform as a cloak for his heinous crimes. A man who not only crossed the thin blue line, but obliterated it in a horrifying symphony of violence and deception. You know, I don't really know what the thin blue line is. I know there's that movie, The Thin Blue Line. Is the, does the thin blue line refer to... If I look this up, will it tell me? There's a little... There's a dictionary built into my PDF reader. The thin blue line is a term that typically refers to the concept of the police as a line which keeps society from descending into violence. Chaos, the blue and thin blue line, refers to the blue color of the uniforms. Oh, that makes sense. Um, the thin blue line is blah, 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 blah. Oh, God, okay. <laughs> we go into white nationalism real quick. The Blue Lives Matter movement since 2014 was associated with white nationalists. Okay, didn't need to know that dictionary. <laughs> Did we have to go there? In a chilling series of events that shook the very foundations of the Hong Kong police force in the early 2000s, Poco committed acts of such unparalleled barbarity that they may seem befitting an outlandish fictional crime figure rather than a biographical documentary. But the devil cop, as he would known to become, was very real. The crimes that made up the twisted symphony he composed, a bank robbery and the cold-blooded murder of both his colleagues and members of the public. Today, we're going to be delving into the enigma that was Poco, exploring his dual life as a devoted public servant and a dark-souled murderer, untangling the sinister web of lies and treachery that surrounded his life, and ultimately trying to get to the bottom of what exactly made his warped and twisted mind tick. Oh. George, I'll tell you what, I'll tell your audience as well. When I picked this one, there were three options that I had to record today. There are three scripts waiting for me in my little recording queue. And I was like, oh, it's Monday morning. I'm going to choose one that's, and I saw this one and I'm like, devil cop. This sounds more like, you know, corruption and money and like gangs, which I know were all bad things, but they're not murder. They're not murder of the public, murder of cops. They're just like financial and like gangy and like, less intense and that's why i chose this one <laughs> it turns out to be about murder oh god the next line the next li so strap yourselves in because this is an intense one george i tried not to ch i chose a non-intense one on purpose based on the title and here we are chapter one the first murder Choi Poko's first victim was 24-year-old Constable Leong Xin Yang, whom he murdered on the 14th of March 2001. Okay, literally, first line, second page, is uh, about a dude getting murdered. What have I chosen? I should have chosen the one about... I'll tell you what the other options were if you're interested. Uh, the other options that I had to record today were... Jim Jones and the Zodiac Killer. So yeah, you can see why I chose this one. And now I realize I've made a mistake. Although I'm sure you guys are loving it. You're, you're always thirsty for blood. Whenever there's one with like gentle crimes, like, oh, what happens? Well, he uh, stole money from um, gangsters. And you're like, oh no, that's what I was hoping for. And instead, murder. <laughs> Today, I want to quickly tell you about our fantastic sponsor, and that is something that has become absolutely essential in my life, and that is Sheath Underwear. Sheath is a game changer. These boxer briefs are perfection. No more too tight briefs, no more overly loose boxers. Sheath is that perfect balance of comfort and support. I'm wearing Sheath right now. 
I have a clean, unworn pair in my hands. In fact, I wear sheaths every day. They are that good. You'll buy one pair and then you'll just be like, oh, I see. I get it. I get it. And then you come back for more. And the next thing you know, your underwear drawer is just overflowing with sheath and everything else has been roughly discarded. Particularly recently, I've been enjoying wearing their extra fresh mesh pairs to the gym which is double comfortable. And the best thing about Sheath is their dual pouch design. At first, I was pretty skeptical. You're like, really? I put this in there and that in there and it all supports everything. And then you try it and you're like, oh, I see. I get it. But some days I'm not feeling that. I just don't want to, you know, have everything put away in special places for whatever reason. And I'll just wear them like a normal pair of underwear. You can do that too. Sheath is flexible like that. So go to sheathunderwear.com and get the most comfortable underwear that you will ever wear. If you use the promo code criminalist, you'll also get a 20% discount on your order. That's sheathunderwear.com promo code criminalist for 20% off your order. And now back to today's video. Shin Yan clocked in at 7am and his day was initially like any other. It was boring. <laughs> he was posted to the Lei Mok Shui police station, a precinct right on the very northernmost edge of Hong Kong's metropolitan mass. The sleepy suburb was hardly a hotbed of triad antics, so he occupied his morning with a foot patrol and a few house-to-house -house courtesy visits before returning to the station to duly eat his lunch and fill out some paperwork. So far, so dull. Honestly, though, if I was a policeman and my job was like patrolling the streets and going out there and seeing what's up, I'd be like, Every day that is a dull day is a good day. Because you know what I don't like to get involved in? Shootouts and crimes. I just, what, what did you say? Oh, I walked around. It's lovely weather. Knocked on a few doors. Said, morning. <laughs> like coppers do. And that was that. Well, how do you say, how do you say greetings? Is it like, is ni hao? Is ni hao how you say that in Mandarin? Ni hao? What do they speak in Hong Kong? They don't, do they speak Cantonese? And, how do I not know this? <laughs> I get so confused between um, the different, there's, because in Taiwan, they speak Mandarin. Do they speak Cantonese in Hong Kong? Maybe they do, so that's probably different. And his dull day seemed destined to stay dull when the station superintendent swung into the lunchroom and gave him his first task for the afternoon. Someone had phoned in a noise complaint on the Shekwai Caucus Gate just down the road, and Xin Yen was to head over, slap some wrists, and deliver some stern words until the inconsiderate neighbor packed it in. He opted to handle the matter alone, as his partner was still eating his lunch, and he saw no need to drag him away from it for such a trivial matter. This sounds like a perfect afternoon. What are you going to do? I'm going to go to tell some guy to turn down his stereo. That would be nice. They have a brilliant look in Prague, where I live, which I never really got at first. I didn't even know was a thing at first. But Prague, despite being a big, like, touristy, busy city, is quiet at night. And I remember one time, I was having a beer somewhere, and we were sitting, out, I was sitting outside with my mate, and we were just having a chat. And I don't know, we were a few beers deep, so maybe we were being a bit like, hey! <laughs> not loud, but just like having a loudish conversation. Just like, you know, not, not a quiet conversation, let's say. And the bartender woman comes out and she says, like, in, in broken English, like, you guys have to come inside or the pol or we'll call the police. And we're like, holy sh**, what? <laughs> this escalated quickly. You could just ask us to be quiet. And I later realized uh, that she wasn't going to call the police. She didn't mean that. She said someone will call the police because after 10 o'clock, no noise outside. Like, and if bars and stuff are making noise, the residents call the police and the police come round and the bars get in trouble because it's like, yo, you've got to be inside quiet after 10 o'clock. And it is quiet after 10 o'clock. And it's awesome because now I go to bed before 10 o'clock because I've got two kids who get up very, very early. He found himself at the address in question, flat 552, Shek To House Block B, in no time at all. But bizarrely, all was deathly silent. He reasoned that the situation had already sorted itself out, but he was already there, so what the hell, he may as well knock on the door and have a word. The situation only got more bizarre, when despite repeated knocking, no one answered the door. He radioed back to the station at 12.25 to report the situation, and was ordered to give it one last knock before giving it up as a bad job and returning to the station. Is he just doing this alone? Don't cops always work in pairs? In the movies, it's always like two cops. And isn't that like to make sure that they've got like backup and that they behave themselves and stuff like that? Unfortunately, why do cops work in pairs? I mean, it seems like obvious because they need like help and, and all of that. But is there a really specific reason beyond like it's good to have two? Or, or bigger question, do cops work alone ever? 
Unfortunately for Xin Yang, however, he'd never make it back to the station, and that radio call would be the last time that anyone ever spoke to him, because as he raised his hand for that final knock, Choi Po Ko had been lingering down the hallway, and he attacked. A vicious melee ensued, in which Xin Yang desperately fought to break away, and Po Ko tried to subdue Xin Yang while reaching for his revolver. We don't know exactly how this melee played out, but we do know that Xin Yang lost. Poco got his revolver and shot him five times at point-blank range, twice in the back and three times in the head. Holy sh! Aren't you in like a block of flats? Someone's gonna hear that, my dude. Uh, George has left me a notice. Some semi-educated analysis. It was and still is common for officers to leave one chamber of the revolvers empty as an extra level of safety against accidental discharge. Oh, that's clever, isn't it? Meaning that only five rounds were loaded into the cylinder, and Poco had emptied the whole lot into Xin Yang. Emptying the cylinder like this typically indicates some degree of intense anger or frustration in a criminal. Likely what happened is Xin Yang was shot twice in the back immediately after Poco secured the revolver, as after pulling it from his side-mentioned holster, that would be the target that naturally presented itself, and the three shots to his head were made purely out of addictive rage once Xing Yang was otherwise incapacitated. Good lord. Like, if you shoot someone dead and then it's like, yeah, just to make sure I'm going to shoot them three times in the head. You've got issues, mate. The chilling and sudden burst of gunfire echoed through the tranquil estate. Yeah, no sh Slicing through the mundane chatter and ambient noise of daily life. If the police get a call being like, oh yeah, there's, uh, there's shooting at this address, it was like, didn't we just send John, or whatever his name was, down there? And they'll be like, yeah, we did just send John down there. We should get the Hong Kong SWAT equivalent down there. Like special operations. What do we call SWAT in the UK? Armed response, something like that. Special armed response, something like that. Yeah, get those guys down there ASAP. So, right. <laughs> just this is a pointless comment. Everyone watching. I'm using a new iPad <laughs> and it's really big. I bought it. I was like, because the one I had before is like I'm always zooming in a little bit. And I was like, yeah, I'll get this bigger one because it's about the size of an A4 page. <laughs> the problem is it's a lot heavier than an A4 page. I'm constantly like, oh, but it's working fine. I just got to get used to it. It's not too big on the screen, is it? <laughs> it's so big. What have I done? Oh, no. I feel like I should get the smaller one. But the smaller one was too small and this one's too big. What am I supposed to do? Everyone listening is like, Simon, we don't care. Even people watching are like, Simon, we don't care. Why are you telling us about iPads? <laughs> Who do you think you are, Marquez Brownlee? Stop telling us about iPads. <laughs> The shocking sound of violence was instantly recognizable, and residents, hearts pounding in their chests, hurried to their phones and dialed 999 to report it. Oh, Hong Kong uses the same as Britain, which makes sense because it used to be British. As the calls flooded into the police station, the urgency and concern in the voices of the residents was palpable. Officers quickly began to piece the situation together, cross-referencing the location of the reported gunfire with the positions of their on-duty colleagues. It was then that a sinking feeling gripped the hearts of those in the command center. One of their own, Xin Yang, was on the estate and was likely the target of this gunfire. Yeah, good. I mean, they figured that out pretty quick. Let's get let, let's get Hong Kong SWAT down. Let's go. This speculation was unfortunately confirmed when they radioed him for a sit rep and received nothing but silence in response. I'm always surprised in movies. I'm sorry. I know I'm going like seven tangents. Today. I've had too much coffee and it's Monday morning. I'm always on Mondays. I'm always like, yeah, work, 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 and I got so much to say. It's like a weekend of like not recording videos. I'm like, let's go. I need to get in front of the mic. Um, I always thought like, why not just pick up the radio? And be like, yeah. <laughs> You know, like sometimes they do in movies. I'd always do that. Radio sounds shit. You'd just be like, go ahead. <laughs> just like in a generic voice. <laughs> go ahead. Without missing a beat, the police sprang into action, desperate to get to their embattled colleague and any injured civilians before it was too late. In an instant, the Lei Mukshu precinct was a ghost town as every single officer on duty downed tools and raced to the scene. Leading the charge was the station's police tactical unit. There we go. PTU. Hong Kong SWAT. A crack team of highly trained and heavily armed officers. By 12.29, only three minutes after the first 999 call, they were in position, their Saxon APCs forming a mighty ring of steel from which nothing would hopefully escape. But they would not be penetrating the building. That would fall to the Special Duties Unit, or SDU, Hong Kong's SAS trained SWAT team. Oh, there we go. So Hong Kong's got like two different SWAT people. The best of the best. They arrived at the scene at the same time as the PTU, having been dispatched by helicopter from the police's rapid response station at the airport. For them, their response was one of pure instinct, honed through harsh and demanding training. They had no time to sit around and debate strategies. There was an active shooter in the building, and every second of dallying was another second that other officers and civilians could be getting killed. Their approach 
was two pronged. Four fire teams would enter the building, two from the top having rappelled onto the roof from their helicopters. Fucking sick. And two from the ground floor. In each direction, one team would take point, clearing the building floor by floor, corridor by corridor, room by room, while the second teams hovered on their heels and evacuated civilians to the safety of both the roof and the cordon on the ground. This is so cool. This is like a movie. I mean, look, I know someone's just been murdered, but it's like you can't deny that this response is. This is the moment in the movies where you're like, let's go. It's exciting. Immediately behind the ground teams was a group of paramedics who had the most unenviable task of treating the wounded and recovering the dead. Fortunately, these brave paramedics were at least well protected, as not only did they have a wall of black clad handy lads covering them, but the PTU had also insisted that they take their body armor before entering the tower block. The crowd outside which now comprised not only the PTU, but also a cohort of curious locals, watched on with bated breath as the building was penetrated and a steady stream of rescued civilians flowed from the building. For several minutes, time flowed in a circle as a constant repetition of apartment clear, no hostiles, civilians evacuated, was called out over the radio. This repetition was only broken when the ground teams reached the fifth floor, and the call of officer down, fifth floor, was made. The paramedics immediately leapt on Xing Yan, clinging to the faint hope that, contrary to what their lying eyes were telling them, they might somehow be able to save him. Bruh. I mean, he got shot three times in the head. It's like, I guess you gotta, like, give it a crack, but it's like, bro, he's been shot three times in the head. His head is probably not looking in the best of states. I always found it quite interesting. Is it, I think it's, it's true in the UK, I don't know if it's true in the US, but only a doctor can declare someone dead. So if, like, someone around, they arrive at, like, uh, I don't know, a horrible chainsaw accident and someone's managed to chop their own head off using a chainsaw. <laughs> the paramedics will be like, well, let's put them in the ambulance, see what they say at the hospital. <laughs> and then I was like, and I declare him dead. <laughs> Like, no sh- he chopped his head off with a chainsaw. Meanwhile, the SDU were pushing deeper and deeper into the tower block. Tragic though their discovery was, there were still civilians to extract and to shoot at a find, so the tears would have to wait. They steeled themselves as they continued, certain that with the discovery of Xin Yang, the shooter wouldn't be far. Much to their shock, the next firearm they would see wouldn't be in the hands of a psychotic criminal, but in the hands of their colleagues, as the four fire teams met each other on the 14th floor. Their search had been meticulous. They had been over every single inch of the building. So this meant only one thing. The gunman had escaped. Clearly, however, this was not the consequence of incompetence. Their response had been absolutely flawless. Yeah, I mean, you just... There's going to be a response time. It's not like shots instantly they arrive on the scene. It's going to be, you know, what, 10 minutes? 50, how long does this kind of sh- take? They're coming by helicopter, so it's going to be fast. But they got to get in the helicopter. The helicopter's got to get up in the air. The helicopter's got to fly there. they got to rappel down. I mean, that dude can just be like, do, 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 do. Just, just sneak away. Oh, wait, he's a cop, right? We know he's a cop because George has told us, which is not unusual. The structure of today's episode is different because George would normally hide this fact from us. So do you think he's just put on his cop's uniform and it's just like leaving that way? That'd be pretty clever, right? So they assume the shooter must have shot Xin Yang and immediately fled the scene, somehow having legs fast enough to carry him away from the scene in the three minutes that it took them to respond. Three minutes! From the airport to rappelling down onto the roof in three minutes. That's 180 seconds. That's mad. With nothing more to be done, both the SDU and the PTU left the scene, handing it over to forensics to get to the bottom of what the hell had happened. They discovered bloodstains on the door frame and the back stairs, but not on the smoke-proof fire door to the right. From this, it was deduced that the murderer had opened the right door and ambushed Xin Yang from there. The bloodstains also showed that Xin Yang had been shot five times, with three of the shots being at near point blank range. More answers came following Xin Yang's autopsy at Wan Chai Police Headquarters. You're gonna be like, turns out he's shot in the head. <laughs> well done. The medical examiner successfully recovered all five bullets lodged within his body, and upon close examination, it was determined that the rounds were all 38 specials, the same rounds that's issued to the police. This naturally raised further questions. Had Xin Yang be shot by his own revolver? Had a criminal somehow got his hands on a police issue revolver? Fortunately, the police keep extensive records on its issuing of firearms, with each officer drawing their firearm from inventory at the start of each shift and returning it when they clock off. What, so you can't buy the same round that the police use? Oh wait, maybe you can't. I remember reading about this, like, we don't have guns on the police in the UK, but in America, the police have, is it called hollow point rounds? The ones that when you shoot, they go into a body and then they, like, they burst on purpose. So, like, if the police shoot someone, then it doesn't go through and through and hurt someone else. Whereas you can't buy those bullets as a civilian, right? Because they're deemed to be, like, too dangerous. Because if you shoot someone, 
then like a through and through is a much better result than like little fragments of bullet going all the way through your body. The serial number would be noted by the armor at both points. In addition, a monthly inventory was carried out on every police cache to make sure that nothing had gone missing. Thanks to these meticulous procedures, the police knew that not a single firearm had gone missing, which left only one possibility. Xin Yang had been shot with his own revolver. The revolver which also happened to be missing and was now unaccounted for somewhere in Hong Kong. Yeah, that's what I would assume. You'd, you'd, that's the general assumption you've got to make, right? That someone grabbed his own gun and shot him with it. This gave detectives a possible motive, the theft of Xin Yang's firearm. Wait, how desperately do you need a gun? But they were taking nothing for granted in this case. The theft of a police revolver could have just been the icing on the cake for the killer. What if someone had a grudge and was targeting Xin Yang specifically to settle some sort of vendetta? Yeah, why, why would you immediately be like, I oh, am yeah, motive, he wanted the gun? Just, if he wants a gun, just go and buy a gun. I mean, how complicated can it be? I mean, it's probably complicated. It's probably not easy to just go and buy a gun. But, like... Black markets exist. <laughs> Sorry, the law requires a five-day waiting period. Five days? But I'm mad now. <laughs> I know it's crazy, but like with the internet these days, surely, like, ten years ago, whatever, you could just go onto like the dark web, right? And buy all sorts of you could like buy yourself a new identity and like black tar heroin. Surely people were selling guns. Wasn't there a Vice documentary or like a documentary like that about some like dude in the Netherlands who just bought a gun on the internet? I mean, the internet's not got like less dodgy in the last 10 years, has it? How hard would it be to just, I mean, okay, but this is, I know this is the past. I'm just trying to say robbing a police officer of his own service weapon is probably not the easiest way to procure a gun. I'd much more assume, oh, this guy's a cop. He's probably upset someone like a gang and they've killed him in retaliation. That's what I would assume to be motive. He's a cop. To get to the bottom of this, they interviewed 350 of his friends, colleagues, and family members. Oh my god, this guy was... <laughs> I, just, I don't know 350 people, for sure. <laughs> if someone's interviewed my friends, they'd probably have to talk to like 10 people and that'd be it. And they'd be like, oh, Simon's really sad. He's got no friends. And my family's not, you're also not big. No one had a bad word to say about Xin Yang, and by all accounts, he was an upstanding guy who would never do anything that would inspire any kind of perverse murderous ire. Also recovered from the scene was a mask and some stray clothing fibers from the killer. They were carefully analyzed by forensic experts who were desperate to uncover more information about the elusive killer that we know to be Po Ko. Using advanced scientific techniques, they managed to extract DNA evidence from these seemingly innocuous items. This was a huge breakthrough, but sadly, not one which would lead to any arrests, as after running the DNA samples through every database they could get their hands on, not a single match was found. So, that's interesting. A cop's not DNA sampled? I feel like that'd be pretty important, even if it's just for like, if there's a crime scene and they're running the DNA, just to be 100% sure, wouldn't you also have the cop's DNA, like the forensic expert's DNAs, also on file, just in case there was some contamination, so you can rule that out? There was little else they could do with the DNA for now, except keep it on file and wait until a match popped up in the future. Well, uh, yeah, fair. All of this left detectives with the most arduous task, as it would be nothing short of a miracle to find the killer after hitting this dead end. Nevertheless, they persisted and followed every lead to its endpoint. They began going through every single second of CCTV footage from Shekto House and the surrounding area and found, well, nothing. The footage from the apartment building proved fruitless. Every single person identified had a harder stone alibi, which led detectives to deduce that the killer must have escaped through the fire escape immediately beside flat 552, the only escape route not covered by CCTV. This established why the killer had chosen that ambush location, but it brought them no closer to actually identifying them. Footage from the wider area proved equally useless. The greater distances of the footage made it harder to identify passers-by, and those who could be tracked also had watertight alibis. All hope was not lost. Over 15,000 people lived on the Shek Wycock estate. Surely one of them had seen something of use. But alas, no. Whoever the killer was, they were a pro, the detectives reasoned, as they had entered and left the scene with all the stealth of a phantom. This left detectives with one last lead. The mask. Even though the DNA evidence found was useless, maybe, just maybe, if they could track down where it had come from, they could find something. Some CCTV footage from the store, a clerk who remembered selling it. Truly, anything at this point would have been a boon. But once again, there was nothing. They even went beyond the borders of Hong Kong and contacted mask manufacturers on the mainland, desperate for absolutely anything that could ratchet them closer toward an answer. But this search also yielded naught. And with that... The case went cold, and Poco was free to roam the streets and strike again. 
Chapter 2. The Bank Robbery Oh, changing it up, are we? This is a completely different crime, okay. As the clock struck midday in the Belvedere Gardens branch of Hang Seng Bank on the 5th of December 2001, all appeared to be normal. At the counter, an elderly woman was withdrawing her pension for the month, and to her side was a young man making inquiries regarding a car loan. Beside them stood a small group of half a dozen or so people, all staring at the clock with great disinterest as they waited to complete their day's dreary financial chores. Yeah, I hate doing shit like this. We have to actually go somewhere. It doesn't happen very often anymore. But sometimes I had to go to the post office, like to get a document legalized, like where there's like um, a notary. And I had to go there and you take a ticket and you wait in line, you have to go up and you show some of your ideas. Like, can't we do, isn't there a digital way to do this? Why have I had to walk across town to go to this bloody office to get like a document notarized? Like, what year is it? The mundane scene wouldn't last long, however, as a short while later, when the clock ticked over to 12.21, the great glass door that separated the sleepy bank from the hustle and bustle of Hong Kong streets was kicked open with a mighty crash, and through it stormed Poco. Like many of the patrons already queued up, he was there to make a withdrawal, but unlike them, he wasn't carrying a bank book. Instead, he was carrying Xing Yang's revolver. It was a robbery. Immediately, Poco waved it high for all to see and issued the usual threats that bank robbers tend to issue. Get on the f***ing grounds and heroes get bullets. He then began advancing on the teller's counter as fast as his legs would carry him. His approach was not an easy one, however, because as soon as he took his first step forward, he was intercepted by Zaffa Khan, the bank's armed security guard. Holy sh**. Okay, go for it, Zaffa. Zaffa had only milliseconds to react and found himself with a very unenviable choice to make in that short time. Did he try to bring his shotgun to bear, a process that between pulling it round, shouldering it and cocking it would have taken several seconds and almost certainly escalate the situation into a shootout that would put civilians in danger, or did he try to talk him down, leaving himself unable to react, but potentially better able to ensure the safety of civilians? Bro, those aren't your only two options. What the, the, the third option is get on the ground and don't do anything. It's just money. It's just a bank. The civilians aren't in danger if he just gets all the money. Is that a security guards really supposed to interrupt like a bank robbery like this? Aren't they supposed to just be there to discourage bank robbery? But in the real, also a, sh a shotgun that takes. It, what sort of situation is this guy supposed to defend from if it takes him ages to like bring his weapon to bear? He chose the latter and selflessly placed himself in Poco's path without any hesitation. Oh, bro, you're going to get shot, my dude. Engaging him in conversation with a simple question, what are you doing? He answered this by pushing the muzzle of his revolver into Zafar's forehead and barking a simple command at him, throw your shotgun onto the floor now. Zafar was having none of that, and he ignored the command, unwilling to give up his potential leverage over Poco. Instead, he pushed his fear aside and continued trying to talk Poco down. George, what leverage do you mean? This, what? This guy has no leverage. He's not got that shotgun in his hands and he's got a gun pressed against his forehead. Don't mess around. Turn around and leave, he said, his determined voice never cracking nor showing fear. Poco was not moved by Safar's bravery, however, and simply repeated his earlier command. But once again, Safar refused to comply, and so with it being clear that he was not going to play ball, Poco pulled the trigger, sending a single 38 special round into Zavar's temple. He immediately crumpled onto the floor, and just to make sure his resistance was over, Poco put another round in his chest. I'm sorry, Zafar, I know that you got killed, but what outcome did you really expect here? Like, what are you doing? Why would you do this? But Safar was not out of the fight just yet. What? He just got shot in the head and the chest. Contrary to what Hollywood tells you, shots to the head, particularly shots from small, low-velocity rounds such as the 38 Special, tend to not instantly be fatal. Whoa, really? And so Zafar mustered the last of his strength and began reaching for his shotgun as the world around him went dark and fuzzy, managing to pull it round, cock it, and begin raising it towards Poco. Try as he might, however, he was unable to get a shot off, and Poco noticed what he was up to, and then sadistically stood above him, and in deranged bemusement, put one more bullet in Zafar's head as the shotgun was shakenly raised towards him. He finally fell down dead. Zafar's sacrifice was not in vain, however, because while he might have only kept Poco distanced for half a minute at the longest, these precious few seconds had allowed O Li Jing, the branch manager, to sound the alarm. She first hit the silent alarm under her desk, then retreated to a shrouded back corner of the bank to call the police, giving them whispered, almost muted updates of the ongoing situation. These updates would soon be cut short, however, as Poco, having dealt with Safar, then turned his attention back to the telecounter and the precious loot that lay inside of it. He leapt through the glass security partition on the edge of the counter and onto the desk. 
It was then that he spotted Li Jing speaking into the phone, who he could easily spot from his new elevated position. What are you doing, Li Jing? I feel like pressing the alarm button is enough. Then just get down on the ground and just wait for the police to arrive, who will do their job, and hopefully this won't turn into a hostage situation. If I was in this... I'm a, I don't feel like it's being a coward in this situation to just get down on the ground and be like... Like, if I was a civilian in that bank, just hanging out, just like getting my car loan or whatever, I'll just be like, get down on the ground. And then I saw this like... It was like a documentary by one of these survival guys or whatever. And they were like, the best strategy is just to become... Just blend into the background as much as possible. They call it being a grey man. Just a grey person. Just like if you're in a hostage situation, just don't look at them. Don't draw attention to yourself. Just sit there silently and comply. Don't do anything. Just let them forget about you. That's what I would do. <laughs> like, it's not my money. It's the bank's money. Let's just take the money. Like, you want some help? <laughs> Infuriated by her interference with his plans, he raised his revolver and let off a single shot. Fortunately for Li Jing, however, for some reason, Poco chose a warning shot rather than a named one, discharging his revolver into the ceiling. He then issued a threat. Don't move. I have a bomb. Drop the phone and get down on the floor. Poor Li Jing was absolutely terrified, but not so overcome with fear that she wasn't able to make a very smart and calculated move as she obeyed his demand, leaving the phone off the hook so the police could continue to listen in. Poco either didn't notice or didn't care about the clearly still connected phone because he then took his sights off Li Jing and he jumped down and ransacked the counters, prying them open and scooping out the cash inside with lightning efficiency, letting himself a total take of 492,880 Hong Kong dollars and 1,091 US dollars. With that, his job in the bank was done. He leapt over the counter and made for the door bursting back onto the bustling streets of Belvedere Plaza, making a left and heading for Haiyan Road, before completely disappearing, having only been in the bank for 1 minute and 18 seconds. But yeah, this guy's MO of just get in and get out real quick is pretty smart, because there's obviously a response time. And we talked about 3 minutes being an incredible response time, but it ain't 1 minute and 18 seconds, is it? With the coast clear in the bank, staff and customers alike dived on Zafar, desperate to aid him however they could. But their efforts were to no avail. He was already long gone. Meanwhile, Li Jing steeled herself following her ordeal and got back on the phone to inform police of the developing situation, who informed her that they were en route and would be there at any moment. The police were true to their word, and less than a minute later, the PTU's sacks and armored cars were screeching to a halt outside the bank. They moved with a choreographed precision, securing the bank's perimeter as their trained eyes scanned the scene for any signs of the culprit. Meanwhile, other units fanned out into the surrounding neighborhoods, their gazes sharp and their senses alert, hunting for any traces of the elusive robber. They sifted through the urban maze, their radios crackling with updates, and their hands steady on their weapons. But fate was not on their side. Po Ko had slipped through their grip and gotten away once again. Simultaneously, paramedics arrived at the scene, their focus firmly set on Zafar. They hastily loaded him into an ambulance and made for Hong Kong Adventist Hospital. They exchanged grim looks as they departed, their faces reflecting the grim reality of the situation. Tragically, their assessments were correct, and Zafar was confirmed dead at 12.30 before he even reached the hospital. With Zafar's tragic passing, the immediate situation at the bank had come to an end, and the task at hand was figuring out who the hell had robbed the place. And with that in mind, once the crime scene was released by the tactical units, forensic investigators began to meticulously search for any remnants of Poco's presence. All they found, however, was three shoe prints on the bank's counters, which clearly indicated a sports shoe of some kind. The shoes had to be identified, as they could prove to be a vital clue that would lead them to identifying Poco. And fortunately, CCTV footage from the scene gave them a pixelated but reasonably clear image of the shoes, and they began trawling through the decathlon catalogue in search of potential matches. Soon enough, they found one that matched the rough blur from the CCTV and the footprint exactly. Jackpot. The shoes in question were Mizuno Next Alphas, a model that had only recently been released, and their sales record showed that only 130 pairs in the criminal size had been sold prior to the robbery. Wow, that is narrowing that sh down right away. You can imagine the air punching that happened in the office when the investigators managed to narrow down the search to such a small pool. Yeah, wow, that is a huge breakthrough. They then tracked down the 40 retailers in Hong Kong that sold the shoes and interviewed the staff and looked at their CCTV to see if they could find anything that would lead them to the robber. One retailer in particular proved most interesting, the police quartermaster that officers could privately purchase gear through. Mmm, are you purchasing your robbery shoes from the police? Po, that doesn't seem like the best idea ever. This naturally cast a wide net of suspicion over the police force, so detectives turned their attention inward, paying particular attention to the shoes that officers brought to physical training. So if you were going to like do crimes, where would you buy your clothes from? You've got you to gotta buy like the most generic clothes possible from the most generic store possible, in cash, 
and ideally wearing a disguise. Like if I was buying clothes for crime, I'd put on a wig, I'd put on some sunglasses, I'd dress unlike myself, and I'd walk with like a non-myself gait. And I'd go there by a very circuitous route, public transport, wandering around, doing all of this stuff. And then I'd go in to Primark with my cash. I'd buy my clothes and then I'd go out of Primark and then I'd go on a very long walk. I'd go like on the subways, whatever. And then at some point I would like change the bag and then I'd change the, the my clothes and then I'd go home and then I'd have my crime clothes and then afterwards I would burn my crime clothes. Crime is complicated and the police are competent, so you got to think about this stuff. Don't buy your clothes from the police. It's just simple stuff here. They also offered a 300 Hong Kong dollar coupon for shoes of that size being turned in, having created some false pretense of why they suddenly needed that model of shoe in that size, hoping that if the robber was indeed one of them, they might accidentally slip up and hand themselves over. Well, they just stole 50,000 Hong Kong or 500,000 Hong Kong dollars. And so that it's like you want a 300 Hong Kong dollar coupon to give your crime shoes over to the police. Like all this would do would be like, oh, I've got to burn those crime shoes real quick. Twelve officers came forward to take them up on the offer, but sadly, none of them proved to be an exact match for the footprints that had been recovered from the bank. And so, with the other 39 retailers not providing any leads either, the shoes became a dead end. Yes, but not also, also not that bad. Because you've got 130... Oh, you're not being able to trace those people, though, are you? Oh, okay, yeah, I get it. Okay, that is a dead end. That's a shame. All hope was not lost, however, because while the shoes were being investigated, another group of detectives had rolled up their sleeves and taken on the arduous task of interviewing over 250 individuals with any and every connection to the robbery. The bank's employees, its patrons, and the unsuspecting passers-by in the vicinity were all meticulously questioned and their memories probed for any shred of information that could help them ID the robber. But as hours turned into days, the sea of voices yielded nothing. Not a single promising lead or shred of telling discrepancy. It was as though the criminal had vanished into thin air, leaving behind only a chilling void where answers should have been. With the little else they could now do, detectives created a best guess sketch of the robber and dangled it out to the public in the hopes that they would get a bite, even offering a million Hong Kong dollars as a reward for any information leading to his arrest, a bounty that was also matched by Han Seng Bank. The case was starting to look hopeless, but they did at least make one solid discovery. The bullet that had ended the life of Zafar was a 38 Special, with the exact same rifling indents as the bullets recovered from Xing Yang's body earlier that year, meaning that while they couldn't be certain it was likely the same firearm had killed them both. Got a note here from George, a slight but pertinent tangent, dear audience, okay? The media perpetuates a lot of overly dramatic nonsense about ballistic forensics, so it's worth taking the time to clear some of these now so you can better appreciate exactly why the police were reluctant to firmly state that it was the exact same firearm at this point. You know what? That, thank you for this tangent, George, because you know what was entering my mind? I'm like, wait, rifling of bullets? That's like fingerprints, because I've seen CSI and they, even in the big, like, you know the intro to CSI they're matching up the bullets I've got it in my mind now where they're like they're both microscopes zoomed in on them and they're twisting the bullet round and they match up the rifling and the marks and they're like got him so I guess that's George is going to tell us that they're not real <laughs> no <laughs> contrary to what you see on many crime procedural shows it's all but impossible to ever truly match up a bullet to the gun that fired it rather such assessments are based on, on deductive reasoning which is to say the concordance of multiple premises that are generally assumed to be true so while you can never match a bullet to a gun that fired it you can point to numerous factors that make it probable beyond all reasonable doubt that it came from that gun well that's good enough Typically, but not exclusively, this process amounts to determining the caliber of the rounds, which is done with a simple visual check, then comparing the rifling indents of the rounds on the microscopic level. In Poco's case, the fact that the indents were all but identical on the rounds recovered from both Safar and Xing Yang, coupled with a very small amount of 38 special firearms in circulation in Hong Kong, both illegally and illegally, allowed police to deduce beyond all reasonable doubt that they were the same firearm. But equally, the police were taking nothing for granted, as this result, as unlikely as it may be, could well be a fluke, as the shape of the rifling indents change over time as the firearms become corroded and worn, or simply by coincidence, 238 special firearms could have the exact same rifling indents. Long story short, while it is obvious to us with 2020 hindsight that the firearms were the same, the police's reluctance here is actually very understandable and a sign of fastidious policing. Well, there you go. CSI isn't always right. Who would have known? With this revelation, the police merged the two cases together and the now two million Hong Kong dollar reward for a successful arrest made the unidentified Poco one of the most wanted men in the world at the time. But unfortunately, 
No further evidence emerged. Once again, Poco had meticulously planned and executed his robbery and thus completely avoided justice and remained free to offend yet again. Chapter 3 The Sim Sha Soy Shooting Following the Hang Seng bank robbery, Poco went quiet for several years and retreated back into the life of an ordinary law-abiding police officer, presumably because he had just caught wind of how close he'd come to being identified following the robbery. But he could only repress his true demonic nature for so long. And after a few years, he found himself with a murderous itch that he had to scratch. And so he set up his next crime, the ambush of two police officers in Sim Sha Soi. It all began on the 16th of March, 2006, at 11 p.m. when Constable Sin Kai Kung and Sang Kwok Hang were walking the streets of Kowloon during a standard nighttime patrol. The night started off tranquil but eventful, as the 24-hour city presented no end of issues for the pair to solve. They began at the Sim Sa Shoi Star Ferry Pier, helping drunken revelers and exhausted businessmen alike navigate their way across the calm waters of Victoria Harbour before turning their attention northwards and pounding the concrete of Canton Road. As they walked, they allowed the ambient glow of neon to be their wayfinder, making courtesy visits to the various late-night establishments that littered the area and seeing if their proprietors required any aid. All proved well, and so they continued their patrol further northward. Proceedings continued to be calm, with the most eventual occurrence of that early stage being a suspicious-looking but ultimately harmless man found loitering on Hai Fong Road. Again... It's like if I was a police officer, that's the sort of day I want. Just like nothing interesting happening, dealing with some drunk people. Cool. But unfortunately for the two constables, this placidity was not to last long. At 1.12 a.m., they found themselves beside the Austin Road pedestrian subway, and after deviating briefly to check in at the police station that stood immediately adjacent to it, they descended into the tunnel. Initially, all appeared well with a faint flicker of the subway lighting, revealing nothing untoward. But as they reached the bottom of the stairs and turned a corner... A strange sight greeted them, a man lingering in the shadows. The man was wearing thick tortoiseshell sunglasses, as well as a very obvious and badly passing wig. Furthermore, he also had a very unsettling expression. Oh yeah, like, this is a terrible disguise. Sunglasses at night immediately make you look mega suspicious. And also, if you're going to wear a wig, make it a good wig! When I was going to, like, buy my criminal clothes, in my example, it'd be like, you bloody well be sure that's a good wig that I bought. Oh god, then you've got to go shopping for the wig somehow, don't you? When will you wear wigs? <laughs> Crime is complicated. Naturally, this attracted the curiosity of Ka Kung and Kwok Hang, who moved in close to investigate. They initially gave the man the benefit of the doubt. Bizarre though the scene was, there was every chance that there was a reasonable explanation of mental health crisis, intoxication, or simply just an unorthodox fashion sense. Yeah, most of the time, the dude wearing the, like, tortoiseshell sunglasses and the... the wig on the subway is just a dude wearing like he's just a bit of a weirdo he's just a weird dude he's not doing crimes except the times that he is this benefit of the doubt was to prove fatally misplaced however because the man of course was poco and he was waiting in ambush sure enough as the officers moved closer he pulled xing yang's revolver from his waistband and opened fire Ka Kong and Kwok Hang had absolutely no time to respond, and before they could even process what was happening in the shadows, let alone have time to draw their own revolvers in response, four rounds had been sent their way, two for each of them. For Kwok Hang, who had been the closer of the two to Po Ko and thus received the most accurate fire, the results were immediate. He took a round to the temple in the neck and immediately fell to the floor. Kakong was hit too, but luckily for him, one of the rounds destined for him missed altogether. And while the other hit him in the face, it only glanced his eye sockets. This immediately left him temporarily blinded, but still very much in the fight. Immediately, his muscle memory, honed through countless hours of monotonous and repetitive training, kicked in, and without even having to think about it, he found himself bringing his revolver to bear and pulling the trigger once to clear the empty safety chamber. Procedure at this point would have been to repeatedly pull the trigger until the threat had been neutralized, but Kakong knew that this wasn't an option, as there was no cover at all in the subway that he could dive to, and if he started exchanging fire while so exposed, sure, he would have probably been able to neutralize the shooter, but the shooter would also probably return the favor. Wait, he already shot you, dude? Exchange of fire has already began! It's time to shoot back! So with few other options, he did the only thing he could do, try to disarm the shooter. He's not the... What am I missing? If this was me, I'd be like, bro, you're getting some lead right now, son. Bang, bang. What? That's not the only option. He advanced and discharged as much fire as his short approach would allow. One single round, which duly found its way into Poco's torso. Oh, okay, 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 sorry. 
George was saying he could do the thing. He's got to disarm him, but he can still use his gun. I thought for some reason, because apparently I'm an idiot, that he's putting his revolver down and trying to disarm him with his hands. <laughs> Which in retrospect makes absolutely no sense and illustrates my small brain. So uh, let's carry on. He then discarded his revolver and initiated a melee, putting all of his weight into a fierce charge while doing his best to grab the revolver. Unfortunately, Poco is a strong guy and he managed to resist Kakong's charge and so the two found themselves in a grapple for life and death. This wasn't quite the disaster it may first sound, however, because while he no longer had his own revolver in hand, he had also taken away Poco's ability to shoot him. Not for want of trying on Poco's part, however, because as the pair wrestled, he desperately tried to get his muzzle pointed at Ka Kong so that he could finish the job. Unfortunately for Poco, however, he had met his match in Ka Kong, who was able to match his strength, and so he began firing wildly in desperation. He let off two further rounds, one of which completely missed, and the other hit Ka Kong in the foot. This made him recoil and take his strength off Poco, who then managed to break free from the melee, and with a sadistic smile firmly plastered on his face, he took a step back reloaded his revolver, and pointed it at Ka Kung. But Poco had let his guard down. He had been so fixated on neutralizing Ka Kung that he had given no thought to Kwa Kang, assuming him to be dead. Yeah, I, I'd, although this dude shot me before, he turned out to like not be immediately dead, like the dude with the shotgun at the bank. I know it's been a few years, but don't you remember? This assumption proved to be very, very wrong, as Kwa Kang still had some life in him yet, and he was laying down on the floor, a revolver drawn, desperately praying that the melee would separate before he bled out so that he could save his partner. And so, when Ka Kung recoiled and took a step back after being shot in the foot, Kwa Kang did what had to be done and emptied his cylinder in the nick of time, placing all five rounds on his target and sending Poco to the floor in a crumpled heap. Let's go! Is this the end? We're only halfway through the episode! He shot him five times, though. What's he possibly going to do? That's it. You've been shot five times? What's happening? He then holstered his revolver and made a chilling single call on the radio. Shots fired on the Austin Road underpass. Multiple officers down, sent help. Then, with his duty done, he took one last look at his injured but very much still alive friend, smiled, and collapsed back onto the floor hero. That call was made at 1.14 a.m., and with the police station being so close, the first responding officers, Sergeant Hua Ji Huang and Constable Lin Zheng Zhong, were on the scene in less than a minute, arriving breathless with revolvers in hand. As they descended the subway stairs, they were greeted by a scene of abject bedlam. Blood, spent cartridges, and tar fragments were strewn everywhere. To their right lay the unresponsive Kwa Kang, and immediately in front of them was Ka Kung, clinging to Poco's collar with all his remaining strength. Without missing a beat, the two officers sprang into action, with Ji Kuang leaping onto Kwok Hang to begin administering first aid, while Zhen Jong handcuffed Po Ko and turned his attention to Ka Kung. Is this it? Is this the arrest? I see, I already see like later down this page, there's the chapter four investigation. So that's it. He's already, I like it. Let's go. Shot him five times. Boom. Mere seconds later, an entire station's worth of PTU officers piled down the stairs, after which, with the immediate scene under control, they were ordered to span out, secure the area, and ensure that the inbound ambulance had a clear path. That ambulance arrived mere minutes later, and Kwa Hang, Ka Kung, and Po Ko were all raced to Queen Elizabeth Hospital, with the latter being accompanied by an MP5-wielding PTU officer just to be safe. Despite having been shot twice, Ka Kung's injuries were found to be minor and he was back on his feet in no time the same was he literally back on his feet he got shot in the foot it's probably gonna be like it's gonna be a minute isn't it the same could not be said for quack hang however the hospital's sterile white walls echoed the solemn finality of his fate and so having lost far too much blood and sustained far too much physical trauma he was declared dead at 1 47 a.m but in a final act of mercy fate did at least allow him to outlive poco who was declared dead two minutes earlier and so at long last, the devil cop was dead, and with him now lying cold in the Wan Chai police headquarters mortuary, it fell to detectives to piece the story together. It's going to be a hell of a piece together, because we're only halfway through. Is half of this episode going to be investigation? Let's go. Chapter 4. Investigation with evidence from the scene still being recovered, the detectives on duty on the 17th of March had one task, identifying Po Ko. We, of course, have known his identity for this entire video, but don't forget he had totally evaded identification up until this point. Fortunately, this task had proved to be an easy one, because as they clocked on early that morning, they emptied their pigeonholes and found a note from the PTU officer that guarded Po Ko when he was taken to the hospital. It turned out that it recognized him. 
It was a hell of a tip, but it still needed confirming. And so, armed with copies of Poco's Hong Kong identity card and police ID, they descended into the basement and towards the mortuary, where, sure enough, the tip was correct. It was indeed Poco, one of their own. This revelation was an unsettling one. Across police headquarters, silence descended like an all-smothering shroud as the unthinkable revelation spread. A miasma of disbelief, betrayal, and sorrow suffused the air. The detectives, usually stoic figures of unwavering resolve, now found themselves wrestling with an insidious unease as they tried to process this betrayal, most foul. But ultimately, those considerations would have to wait. There was still a job to be done. And so, the detectives steeled themselves and continued their investigation. Officers were immediately dispatched to Raider's home, his lockups, his police locker, anything in any way associated with him, and stripped them bare of all their evidence. This naturally took some time. So in the meantime, other detectives occupied themselves with piecing together Poco's movements on the day of the Sim Sha Soy incident, and by the end of that same day, by combining his work schedule with CCTV footage from both traffic cameras and businesses in the surrounding area, they fully understood his movements. They discovered that he clocked off work and left Lantau North Police Station at 11.48 p.m. and then headed for his home at Yu Tung Court on foot, before then jumping on his motorbike and heading for the Yat Tung Estate. From here, he hitchhiked his way to Yao Ma Te and walked southwards down Nathan Road to the Austin Road subway, arriving on the scene at 12.21 a.m., less than an hour before he ambushed Ka Kung and Kwa Kang, although it pained them to admit it. Detectives could only be impressed by the meticulousness of his planning. By using a vehicle not tied to himself and completing the final leg of the journey on foot, tracing him would have been highly difficult, if not impossible, had he not been foiled and caught red-handed. This at least answered the how and the what questions. So now the detectives turn their attention to the why. This would be a much more elusive question, and one that would take much longer to answer. Fortunately, the day spent piecing Poco's movements together had given the detectives time at the crime scene and the house to do their thing, so now a steady stream of evidence was flowing into police headquarters. What is his motivation? I mean, stealing the gun was just a bit strange. That just seems like he wanted to murder someone. Robbing the bank can be for money. The murder of these two officers just seems like he's a psychopath who wants to murder people. Which is really hard to pin like a motivation on. It's just what's his motivation? He likes killing. That's very tricky. Hundreds of pieces of evidence were bagged and tagged for the detective's consideration. So, for the sake of expediency, let's now focus on one item of particular interest. A piece of paper found on his motorbike, on which was scribbled a copy of the Sim Sha Soi police station's patrol schedule, as well as some notes regarding the various pedestrian subways on the route, highlighting how the one on Austin Road was the only one equipped with dome mirrors and how it had, quote, particularly bad lighting. This chilly revelation made it apparent to the detectives that they were not dealing with a deranged crime of impulse here, but one that had been carefully and meticulously planned. And once again, they begrudgingly had to acknowledge just how good he was at planning out his crimes. Small pieces of evidence such as this continued to pile up as the days went on, but it was only when they came to investigate Poco's revolver that they pieced all three of his crimes together. It was in a very bad way when it hit the detectives' desks. Its grip was covered in layers of aged and well-worn electrician's tape, and its frame was showing scars from years of negligent maintenance. But worn through it was, as ballistic experts peel back the layers of tape, the serial number RHKP4893 was still clear as day, firmly identifying it as a police firearm. Naturally, they ran its serial numbers, with everyone assuming that it was either his issued revolver or that it was stolen from an armory, and that accordingly a negligence armorer was about to have the hammer of God come down on their heads. But of course, we know it wasn't. We know that it was Lung Xing Yang's, and now, having run its numbers, the police did too. The case had suddenly got much bigger. But this only firmly linked Poco to two of the three crimes that we've discussed thus far, because if you recall, the revolver's use in the bank robbery was only speculative and hadn't been proven beyond all reasonable doubt. They needed something else, something concrete, that couldn't be dismissed as circumstantial to really prove Poco had committed the bank robbery. Fortunately, with the leftovers of Poco's life finding their way to Wan Chain steady flow, that connection arrived soon enough. Specifically, it came from the contents of Poco's TV cabinet, in which were mementos of his participation in the 2000 Yin Chuan International Motorcycle Festival and a diary which mentioned a red tracksuit which sounded very similar to the one we saw earlier on a very particular CCTV image. Naturally, the detectives were like moths to a flame over this discovery, but it still wasn't enough. The evidence by this point 
was still circumstantial. Sure, by this point, Poco was waddling like a duck, quacking like a duck, flapping his wings like a duck, so generally could be assumed to be a duck, but assumptions weren't good enough, because what if, somehow, it's just one hell of a coincidence? So with that in mind, detectives delved further into the box, keeping their fingers crossed and praying that they'd find the tracksuit jacket from the CCTV images. But alas, it was nowhere to be seen. What was found, however, were several Polaroid photos of him in the jacket, and it was a one-to-one -one match for the jacket from the CCTV. So bingo, they'd nailed him. What are you doing? How can you be a cop and be so shit at crimes? Like, you got this red tracksuit from, like, a motorcycle festival that you went to, so it's going to be quite unique. If you were wearing just a regular Primark jacket, no one's gonna know. It's just a generic jacket. What have you done? And why haven't you burned it afterwards? Why haven't you burned those pictures? It's the least you could do. Ultimately, despite an exhaustive investigation, no connections to any other crimes would emerge. But that wasn't the end of the detective's work, not by a long shot. There were still many questions to answer and many blank details that needed filling in. What's more, given the particularly barbaric and unusual nature of Pogo's crimes, the detectives were determined to leave no stone unturned. So with that in mind, the investigation plowed ever onwards. Some more evidence of interest came from Poco's locker room at Lantau North Police Station, in which was found evidence of extensive surveillance carried out on Xingyang prior to his murder. More specifically, they found a notebook that contained extensive personal information about him, including biographic information, family details, as well as a scribbled copy of both his and his partner's patrol schedule, with an additional doubly underlined note saying that Xingyang's partner tended to take much longer to eat his lunch than Xingyang himself. Bro. You're literally a police officer and you're writing down your crimes. This is insane. This made it abundantly clear that for some reason, Poco had gone out of his way to target Xing Yan specifically. Although we have no idea why, because as mentioned earlier, no one interviewed could think of any reason why someone would take umbrage against the poor officer, and no evidence was ever found explaining Poco's reason for specifically targeting him. My theory is this guy, he's obviously a psycho. Like, he just likes murdering. He's gone itch to murder. Anyone who has an itch to murder, psycho. So, my theory is this guy's just like, they're, they're hanging out at the police station one day and he says something, he does something that just mildly upsets Poco. And he's just like, I'm going to fucking kill you. I'm going to shoot you in the face. And then he does that and he just plots it out because he's a psycho. Sometimes. It's just because he's a psycho. In another chapter of this complex saga, detectives also found themselves embarking on a quest to interview every person connected to Poco. The effort was colossal and the process grueling as they sought to extract truth from the vast array of both professional and personal relationships that Poco had developed over the years. The number of people interviewed was simply staggering, with the officers involved conducting interviews with 2,849 serving police officers, 623 former officers, and 195 civilians who, due to their varying degrees of connection to Poco, were all considered potentially significant to the investigation. Imagine it's like 3,500 people. How, who knows that many people? Who, how, like, who has so many people that know them? I mean, like, obviously not famous people, but like, you know, regular people. Like, what the f***? <laughs> many of these interactions seem to yield little to no valuable information, the majority merely adding to the seemingly endless ocean of dead ends and red herrings. But every so often, a precious nugget of information would reveal itself, a remark he once made, a behavior they had noticed, or irregularities in his schedule. Each piece of new information was like a tiny but vital piece of the puzzle, inching the investigators closer to understanding the enigma that was Poco. This stage of the investigation was of great interest to the police's behavioral psychologists, who were paying very close attention because as the story ratcheted ever closer to completion, the initial shock of the discovery was replaced with a stalwart determination that something like this should never be allowed to happen again. <laughs> that was the stalwart realization. How about we don't have police officers killing other police officers again? <laughs> well done, guys. Genius. And they were the ones who would figure out how. Oh, okay, they're actually going to solve this problem. Okay, I thought this was just like, this must never happen again. And then, you know, like, that's it. <laughs> it's like, oh no, let's see what they do. Meanwhile, the detectives focused on the bank robbery had a breakthrough. They discovered how he escaped unnoticed. They did this by comparing the octopus card records of Poco and his wife with the station CCTV footage. And this revealed that he actually used his wife's card. Note from George, for those who don't know, the Octopus card is Hong Kong's smart travel card. Think London's Oyster card or New York's Omni card. Okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> can't imagine that's particularly common knowledge outside of Hong Kong. If someone asked me before you said that, what was the London one called? I'd be like, okay, 
I know it's an Oyster card. I used to have an Oyster card. I think they eventually replaced Oyster cards. You could just tap in with your bank card, couldn't you? And then they'd figure it out from there. But yeah, Oyster cards. Wouldn't have been able to name it. Definitely don't know the Octopus card. The records showed that at 11 a.m., he took the E31 bus to Discovery Park, then transferred to the 96B Green Mini bus to Belvedere Garden at 11.53 a.m., where he then committed the robbery just afternoon. He must have kept his head down and hidden in the immediate aftermath of the robbery because the card wasn't used again until 13.14 p.m. when Boko took the subway to go to work. What are you doing using your bloody Oyster card, your Octopus card, to travel to commit crimes? Just buy an anonymous Oyster card. Just go to the news agents and be like, hi, one Oyster card, please. And pay in cash. Put it aside. Weeks, preferably. Buy it somewhere very far away from where you're going to commit the crimes. And then you've got your nice anonymous Oyster card. Easy. What are you up to? Make sure that the time between buying that Oyster card and using it is long enough for them to have deleted their CCTV footage or whatever news agents you bought that at. So I don't know what sort of time that is, but eventually the tapes will record over themselves. You need to wait that long at least. Come on, criminals. It's not that hard, is it? Naturally, that same team was also very keen to know exactly what he had done uh, with the money from the robbery, a curiosity that was soon satisfied when they started probing through his financial records, which showed it opened 12 different investment accounts with different banks across Hong Kong, and over the next two years had slowly trickled cash deposits into them that totaled 557,718 Hong Kong dollars. Given the fact that he stole 492,880 Hong Kong dollars during the robbery, I think we can guess where the majority of those deposits came from. Um, how about, like, if a detective has 12 bank accounts, you, uh, you look into that guy. Like, I mean, there's reasons to have lots of bank accounts if you're rich. Because I don't know what it is in America, but in Europe, they, like, insure you up to 100,000 euros. So if you have more than 100,000 euros in a bank account and that bank goes out of business, you're f***ed except for the 100k. So there's lots of reasons to have lots of bank accounts. But if he's a cop, and let's say he's not having, like... <laughs> You know, he's not opening bank accounts because he's got $100,000 and wants to be insured. How about that suspicious? Isn't someone being like, why do you need that? Why do you have 12 investment accounts? You're a cop. Come on, what's up? I feel like they even ask you these questions when you open a bank account. There's one thing called being a politically exposed person, which basically means, are you more likely to be able to be bribed? <laughs> or like uh, blackmailed and stuff like that. And then they'll ask, the, uh, it's like, no. <laughs> but like, if you're a police person, I guess you are. So they like, look after you a bit better or like look into you a bit better more pertinently in this case this just seems very it just seems very bad at crimes in general eventually however after months of painstaking investigation meticulously combing through the fragmented pieces of poco's dual life the police were now prepared to present their findings to the court with no perpetrator left to prosecute the case was heard by the coroner's court rather than the high court that would normally hear such crimes uh, i believe that this type of court may be something unfamiliar to many of you in the audience hong kong's coroner's court oh okay i just assumed it was a name for some reason is the specific branch of the judiciary that specifically deals with matters of death Oftentimes, it's responsible for things that are quite mundane, death certificates, autopsy requests, etc. But it's also tasked with investigating the causes and circumstances of deaths suspected or known to have been criminal in nature. So this court's dealing with really important sh and really boring sh It's like, next on the docket, issuing a death certificate for John. Next on the docket, 17 people murdered by gangs. <laughs> In this instance, because Poco was already dead and therefore unable to stand trial, it fell to this court to get to the bottom of the matter. We should not dwell too much on the proceedings of the trial, as largely they just heard an expanded and more detailed explanation of the evidence that we've already discussed in this chapter. What is worth noting, however, is that 116 witnesses were called to testify, and 258 exhibits, out of a total of 1,073 collected, were presented to the court as evidence. This, <laughs> they're really locking this case down for a dead man. Two months later, on April the 25th, the court fell into a tense hush as the verdict was delivered. The jury, standing unanimous, declared Poco guilty of his chilling crimes. This man, once seen as a protector in his uniform, was now condemned as a predator, a terrifying embodiment of betrayal. Well, not so terrifying, because he's dead. This verdict marked not only the end of a gruesome chapter, but also the beginning of a critical period of introspection for the police force. With the investigation culminating in this monumental verdict, the police could now shift their focus inward and undertake a determined effort to prevent the emergence of another devil cop within their ranks. Chapter 5. Police Reform So we're well aware by this point that the police force was absolutely adamant in making sure that another Poco never joins their ranks ever again. 
but how exactly did they do this? A major reform was the introduction of a stricter procedure for handling complaints in reporting rooms. Now, officers were obliged to request Hong Kong identity card details from any individual reporting a crime in order to add a layer of verification and protection. Whoa, 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 whoa. They're obliged? That seems a bit much. It's like, yo, I want to report a crime anonymously. And if they're like, well, we need your ID card, I'd be like, well, I'm not going to report the crime then, am I? Because I want to be left anonymous because I don't want to be killed. Like, what the f***? Of course, the effectiveness of this measure was not without its limitations. It relied on the honesty of the reporting individual, and during emergencies, it was instructed that officers be dispatched before the identity was confirmed. Yet, despite its flaws, this process was a clear attempt to provide some measures of safety against ambushers like the one that ended Xing Yang's life. This seems very onerous. Arguably, there was no perfect solution to this problem. After all, the inherent risks of police work can never be entirely mitigated. This seems to me like I'm all for making police work safer. But at the cost of reducing the number of people who are reporting crimes, that seems very risky. It's like, 999, what's your emergency? I'm being robbed. Okay, can I have your ID number, please? <laughs> it's like, no, I'm being robbed. Come, quick. But this procedure at least represented a proactive effort to protect officers to the best of the force's ability and in a way that didn't compromise response time. Seems like it can compromise response time, and it certainly compromises the amount of people willing to report crimes. Like, oh, I just saw a gang shoot someone in the street. Okay, what's your name? Uh, fucking no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Another crucial reform tackled the issue of loan patrolling. This practice has previously seen officers on their beat alone from time to time. Oh, we talked about this earlier. Which, as evidenced by Xin Yang's murder, was a system primed for exploitation by criminal elements. As a result, the force made a decisive change. Officers were no longer permitted to patrol alone, except in the most pressing of emergencies. Some senior members of the force did express concern that this would not leave enough manpower to staff all patrols, but fortunately, the size of the force, which had always been uncharacteristically large by world's standards thanks to Hong Kong's wild colonial years allowed for this adjustment without any problems, since there were more than enough officers on the books to accommodate this new measure. That's interesting. I never thought of Hong Kong as like a particularly crimey area, but apparently they've, maybe it's because they've got loads of police. Finally, and arguably most crucially, it was the rigorous and comprehensive re-evaluation of the mental health screenings for potential officers. That seems like a much better way to handle this. Poco's crimes made it blatantly clear that a basic psychological assessment was insufficient to determine a candidate's suitability for policing. And so the force introduced world-leading mental health screening for all recruits. Great idea! It seems like generally a good idea that you should mentally vet your police officers. Like, that seems like a good idea for every country everywhere. Like, it would mean there's less police who are psychos and shooting people and killing people and causing all sorts of trouble. They also extended mental health screening beyond recruitment and now would look after and monitor officers throughout their whole career. This is excellent. This is all good. I think this is really strong. The updated screening process encompassed psychometric tests, structured interviews, and observational assessments, all undertaken by trained psychologists that were to identify any potential risk factors early and, if needed, immediately ensure that the officer received the treatment warranted or was dismissed from the force if appropriate. And just to be safe, every officer was made to take this new assessment within a year of it being implemented. Chapter 6. Psychoanalysis So, now we have a comprehensive understanding of what Poco did and the fallout of his crimes, but still there's a burning question that remains unanswered. Why? Why did he commit such brutal crimes? What drove him to such depravity? I feel he's just a psycho. I have to say, normally in these casual criminal episodes, we always start with the guy's background, where he came from, how he got super f***ed up. We flipped the script today. Ultimately, that is a question we don't have the answer to. Oh, okay, that's probably why we flipped the script, because there's no, like, he was born here and he had abusive parents and blah, 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 making of a murderer. Poco's death meant that he could never receive a full and proper analysis from psychologists, and furthermore, despite the litany of evidence he left investigators, an explanation was not among it. This leaves us having to speculate and draw what conclusions we can from the scraps of evidence that he did leave us. Fortunately, we're not the only people to have had these questions, so rather than having to draw from the lowly pontifications of a humble YouTube wordsmith, there is an absolute wealth of expert insight that we can draw upon, so let's dive into it. I wonder how true my theory of it's just like he was a psycho who liked killing people. Is there more to it? There's more, many more pages, so I guess so. The first such analysis comes from one Dr. Zhu Pei Hong, a clinical psychologist who was serving with the Police Psychological Service Division at the time of Poco's death. He led an investigation based on discussions with Poco's family and 16 letters that he wrote to his wife immediately preceding his demise. 
Dr. Zhu found that during his early years, his parents made every effort to shape him into an industrious young child with exceptional self-assurance and self-control. Uh-oh. <laughs> I feel like that's what I'm trying to craft my children into. Like, industrious, good self-assurance, good self-control, all of those things. I think these are super positive traits. Like, industriousness. Like, that's, that's getting sh done. His upbringing was also found to be free from any irregularities or abuse that could have served as the foundations of a mental collapse. The closest thing to trauma that he found was some initial integration struggles when he relocated to Hong Kong from the mainland at the age of seven, mostly from having to adjust to speaking Cantonese rather than Mandarin. Well, there we go. There's an answer to earlier question. They speak Cantonese in Hong Kong. Otherwise, Poco's earliest years appear to have been generally joyful and happy. Not what I expected, to be honest. Similarly, Dr. Zhu uncovered no real problems during Poco's adolescent years, noting that by this stage he was fiercely intelligent, with a reading age well in excess of that of his peers. He was also exceptionally independent as a teenager, being perfectly happy in groups, but more than content with his own company. This seems like a regular, above, way above average dude. All in all, it appeared as though he was perfectly well adjusted and a normal teenage boy. But Dr. Zhu, normal teenage boy, he seems like he's like, he's a better than a normal teenage boy. But as Dr. Zhu continued to probe into his adult life, potential issues and triggers started to present themselves thick and fast. Poco's parents had gotten divorced in 1990, and despite being aged 20 at the time, he appears to have taken this very, very badly. The family had always been important to Poco, so this divorce, which came as a complete surprise to him, was akin to his entire world being torn apart. He coped with this by placing all of the blame on his father, with whom his relationship all but ceased following the divorce. Still, though, his psyche appeared sound all in all. Dr. Zhu also pointed to his police record during this period. Poco had first joined the force in 1993, and as much as the psychometric tests of this period were admittedly crude, as we discussed earlier, they still highlighted nothing of concern. Furthermore, there were no marks on its record for unwarranted violence or aggression in his early career, so the question is where did it all go wrong? According to Dr. Zhu, that turning point was 1998, when two major events occurred that warped his mind dramatically. The first was a failed promotion to operations sergeant, which made him hateful toward the police force and exceptionally envious of other officers who were climbing the ladder quicker than him. Yeah, this is tough, especially like, he's obviously bright and industrious and all this stuff. He's like, why aren't I getting this? Why is it someone else and not me? Like, that's, that's, yeah. But so what? There's plenty of people that discover their dream career wasn't all it was cracked out to be and confine themselves to a life of punching in and punching out and just collecting a paycheck. Yeah, but this isn't this guy. Plenty of people are like this, but this guy's personality is not wired that way. But they don't go on murder to murder their colleagues, do they? So surely there has to be more to it. Yeah, I'm not saying like... Like, if I was in this position, I'd be feeling the same way as this dude. I'd be like, what the f***? Like, I'm working hard. I'm doing everything right. Why aren't I getting promoted? Like, I'm trying. Like, all of this stuff. And then I'd probably just change the job so I'd have to find something that I'm better at because I wouldn't like to be left behind. Um, but no, I would probably wouldn't go on and murder my, my colleagues. <laughs> that seems insane. If I probably, I mean, I definitely wouldn't. Well, sure enough, there is. And that would be the second turning point in 1998 that Dr. Zhu identified. Remember that divorce? The one that Poco blamed his father for? Yep, I do, because it was two paragraphs ago. And had subsequently cut off all contact with him as a result again? Yes. Well, it turns out it was actually his mother who caused it by cheating on her husband with another man and being caught in the act, which Poco found out about in 1998. The sudden revelation threw his entire perception of the world into question and he began to be riddled with self-guilt and excessively questioned absolutely everything about the world around him. According to Dr. Zhu, this was the point that the cracks in his psyche started to show as psychotic and schizophrenic tendencies began to gradually take over his mind. But Dr. Zhu also stressed that this transformation was a slow and gradual process. It was not overnight by any stretch of the imagination, and that Poco had plenty of time to recognize the changes that were happening in him and try and seek help. Oh, just like that, right? Yeah. I mean, seeking help is not that easy. It's really not that easy. And I imagine, like, today, it's a lot easier than it was in the 1990s. Like, there's been a stigma around mental health, and there is a stigma around mental health for a very long time. Indeed, it appears that for a time, that was exactly what Poco tried to do, as in mid-1998, he took a sabbatical from the police force and embarked on a 3,000-kilometer cycling trip across mainland China to, and I quote here, clear his head, in addition to regularly reaching out to his younger brother to discuss his inner struggles. Unfortunately, this would do little to dispel the demon that was brewing inside of him, and over the following years, his mental health spiraled even deeper. Upon returning to the force in late 1998, he finally got the much-coveted promotion to operations sergeant but turned it down in favor of serving as a traffic officer, reasoning that a more action-y field role would suit him better. But this choice 
ended up soft blocking further promotion because the natural progression beyond this point was to try out for the SDU, a role which he was firmly rejected for on account of his unwillingness to give up smoking and drinking. There's a, there's a note here for me. Slight tangent, but the entry requirements of the SDU are actually kind of insane, and it's easy to see why they're such absolute units, in addition to being flatly banned from smoking and drinking as previously mentioned. Potential SDU officers are expected to demonstrate exceptional tele- intelligence via their high school qualifications and tests conducted during assessment, as well as physical excellence through feats such as multi-hour-long swims in near-freezing water, repeated weighted runs up and down Hong Kong's highest peaks, and continual bodyweight exercises to the point of total failure. Putting all his eggs in that basket might have been a tad foolish, and I don't think anyone would be able to try out for the SDU and be sure of their success. That sounds intense. So you've got to be like super, you've got to be willing to do it, for one. You've got to be super smart, so there are other options open to you. Plus, no drinking, no smoking, and you've got to be a physical specimen. That sounds extremely hard. For Dr. Zhu, this was when Poco crossed the point of no return, when the cracks in his psyche fully gave way, and his becoming a monster became not a matter of if, but when. This was then only made worse by a subsequent relocation to Tongchung, a sleepy town on the northern tip of Lantau Island, as he found life now dull and monotonous, and found himself all but completely cut off from his support network of family and friends, which in turn further drove him to make reckless and impulsive decisions. This loneliness even led him to contemplate divorce, as well as developing an expensive habit of seeking solace in the arms of sex workers. Further still, Dr. Xu noted that in the immediate lead-up to Xin Yang's murder, Poco's behavior had become more erratic than ever, bordering on the, frankly, bizarre at times. For example, he listed himself as unemployed when applying for a replacement Hong Kong identity card and was becoming notably short-fused and aggressive at work, showing a clear disdain and hatred for the police force, which had offered him gainful employment for so many years. Taking all of this into account, Dr. Zhu's final conclusion was that family stress and career disappointment had laid the foundations of his mental collapse and introduced psychotic and schizophrenic traits into his mind, and that continued work stress, coupled with removal from his pre-established support networks, allowed these new traits to snowball out of control, turning him into the murdering monster that we have known him as throughout this video. Now, this is certainly comprehensive and makes for a fascinating insight, but Dr. Zhu was far from the only expert that the police utilized while trying to get to the bottom of Poco's mental condition. So now, let's look at what others had to say and see if we can garner any more insight. Specifically, let's look at the research opinion of Huan Cheng Rong, who was director of the Criminology Curriculum Research Center at City University Hong Kong at the time of Poco's death. He presented a different hypothesis, speculating that Poco's recurrent failures to secure a promotion may have engendered a profound resentment towards his superiors. This, he proposed, could have spiraled into oppositional defiant disorder, a condition characterized by persistent anger, irritability, and a vindictive defiance toward authority figures. When Poco relocated to Tung Chong, he found himself bereft of outlets to express his mounting frustration. According to Dr. Huang, this could have prompted Poco to seek validation and a sense of achievement outside his workplace, with his criminal activities serving as a twisted form of release from his accumulated discontent. Dr. Huang also suggested that Poco's introverted personality could have contributed to a warped self-perception of victimhood, breeding a sense of superiority and a steadfast belief in his own infallibility. He pointed to Poco's early career success as a catalyst for this inflated self-image. A feature article in the official police publication Offbeat, lauding Poco's exemplary performance in the police promotion exam, was highlighted as the likely source of an inflated sense of superiority. However, as his career plateaued, this ego was bruised, leaving him embittered. In Dr. Huang's assessment, Poco may have sought to assuage his perceived failings in increasingly horrific ways, leading ultimately to the shocking crimes that we've discussed earlier. That's super intense. <laughs> it's like you didn't get promoted to work, so you became a murderer. So, we currently have the opinion of two expert psychologists from Hong Kong, but let's try to expand our perspectives and look at the opinions of those from further afield. Fortunately, there's no shortage of these, as the police themselves sought outside opinion while trying to get to the bottom of Poco's mental state. James J. McNamara, an expert in criminal investigation from the FBI, offered an altogether different perspective on Poco's motivations. He proposed that Poco may have been wrestling with dissociative identity disorder. That's the, 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 is that the multiple personality thing? This theory emerged from his scrutiny of witness accounts, highlighting Poco's extreme dedication to maintaining physical fitness, his choice of solitary sports, and his notable lack of any participation in social activities, including work-related banquets and celebrations. These traits portrayed Poco as an introverted individual, seemingly disinterested in social accolades, while simultaneously demonstrating an unrelenting drive for professional growth. 
McNamara drew particular attention to Poco's failed attempt to join the SDU. He also discussed Poco's puzzled reaction to his superior's lack of admiration for his diligent enforcement of minor offenses, as they instead encouraged him to concentrate on more severe crimes. McNamara hypothesized that these experiences contributed to building a wave of frustration in Poco over time. The simmering resentment might have compelled him to seek the adrenaline rush that he felt his day-to-day -day police work lacked. This, McNamara suggested, could have been a pivotal factor leading to Poker committing these chilling crimes. Another outside opinion comes from Roderick Broadhurst, head professor of the Department of Criminology at Queensland University of Technology in Australia. And like McNamara, he too was brought in by the police to provide expert counsel on Poco's mental state. Broadhurst suggested, the Poco's high intellect, juxtaposed with his lack of opportunity to pursue higher education, resulted in a profound dissatisfaction with his career in the police force. This discontentment, he believed, reached a tipping point just days before the horrific Sim Sha Soy shooting, following a reprimand from a female superior, which likely rekindled latent feelings of disappointment and humiliation. In examining Poco's personal life, Broadhurst hypothesized that his interpersonal relationships were superficial at best. He claimed that this was especially apparent in his marriage, which was marred by his repeated infidelity, which further evidenced Poco's chronic dissatisfaction with his lot in life. A curious facet of Poco's personality, according to Broadhurst, was his possible delusions of grandeur, of molding the world in his own vision. Poco, a fervent reader of Chinese and international war history, often expressed contempt for political leaders hinting at his own political aspirations. A philosophical note found beside his bed spoke of life purpose and divinity, suggesting a desire to ascend from his mundane existence to a godlike status. Okay, wait, <laughs> Jesus, That's, he's, he's beginning to sound quite delusional, isn't he? This brings our expert analysis to a close. We've journeyed through Dr. Zhu Pei Hong's theory of a slow and gradual mental decline due to family trauma and career disappointments. We've covered Dr. Huan Cheng Rong's suggestion of oppositional defiant disorder born from a deep-seated resentment. We've entertained James J. McNamara's intriguing proposition of dissociative identity disorder. And lastly, we've reflected upon Professor Broadhurst's notion of Poco as an intellectual in the midst of a murderous identity crisis. But which of these is correct? Well, that is for you to decide, dear viewer. I am but a humble YouTube wordsmith, and such answers, if answers to a matter so subjective even truly exist, is significantly beyond my pay grade. Yeah, look, I'll speculate, why not? <laughs> I reckon this dude was, he's smart, he's successful at a young age, and he enters the police force, and they're like, you're going to be the next big thing. You, you got it. This is your time. And then he does that, and he succeeds for a little while, but then he bumps up against something, and he just can't break through and other people get promoted and that really upsets him and because he's already a little bit broken inside he just has this crazy resentment building up and he doesn't know what to do with it so he kills people which is crazy but crazy is as crazy does crazy does as crazy is whatever that chapter seven remembrance we have no interest in producing mere murder porn here on this channel, but regrettably, it is the reality of the matter on these videos that they're naturally going to pay more lip service to the killers who occupy a greater proportion of the story than their victims, which occupy less. So, with that in mind, as we draw this video to a close, let's cast the name of today's killer from our minds and do what we can to right that wrong by focusing in on those who we really ought to remember. Let us begin with Liang Xinyang, today's first victim. Following his murder, he was posthumously honored with a silver medal for bravery in 2002. This was in recognition of the extraordinary courage he displayed in his final moments. He left behind a family who had their home plunged into grief. A mum, a dad, a sister, and a brother, none of whom would ever get to see the family member of whom they had been so proud ever again. He was also survived by his fiance, who was set to marry in May 2001, less than eight weeks after his killing. He was buried with full police honors in a somber ceremony attended by leading figures such as Chief Executive Tang Chi Hua, Police Commissioner Tsang Yam Pui, and of course, his family. I won't disclose which cemetery he's buried in, but you'll be pleased to hear that his plot is well attended and cared for. Sadly, there's no paper trail for what happened to Zavar Khan following his death, so instead, let us take the time to remember his exceptional bravery, for he was a man who had every opportunity to save his own skin and retreat to safety, but instead, he completely relinquished that opportunity in order to try and keep the civilians in his banks safe. A real hero. And then there's Sang Kwok Hang, the officer who refused to die until it ensured the safety of his friend and colleague. How am I even meant to put the bravery of this magnitude into words? In recognition of this feat, he was posthumously awarded the Gold Medal for Bravery, among the highest gallantry awards that can be awarded in Hong Kong, which I think we can all agree is more than earned. 
An elaborate funeral procession headed by his friends and colleagues escorted him on his final journey, and he was then cremated with full police honors at the Universal Funeral Parlor in Hung Hom. A service attended by Chief Executive Tsang Yam Kuen, Police Commissioner Ling Ming Kwai, and of course, his family. We also mustn't forget Sing Ka Kong, for while he might have survived his encounter with today's killer, his life has been irrevocably changed, and he will carry the scars, both mentally and physically, for the rest of his life. Like his colleague Sang Kwok Hang, he displayed gallantry of the highest possible order. And so he was awarded the gold medal for bravery and recognition. He went on to have a long and fruitful career following his recovery, remaining on the force and eventually being promoted to desk sergeant before he then retired recently, wrote a book about his experiences, and began volunteering his time with a number of trauma and mental health charities. Despite bouts of despair, he appreciates the simplest joys of life and cherishes each passing moment, determined to live life to its fullest, not just for himself, but also for his dear friend, who never got the opportunity. Dismembered Appendices A few notes on my research methodology for this video. As ever, my first port of call was the Hong Kong Police Force, with whom I made a request to access archival information, as well as to see POCO's service record and otherwise receive their comments on the case. However, much like I found when researching the Yoga Ball murders, this proved largely unfruitful, as today's case was far too recent to be publicly disclosed, with many of the relevant files still being restricted under various privacy laws. This, of course, is completely understandable, as some of the people mentioned in today's video are still alive. Similarly, my network of police veterans that I usually squeeze for information while writing these scripts proved to be of little utility simply due to the fact that of the few of them that happened to be on the force during Poco's time, none of them ever had any encounters with him on the job, and they had all long retired when his crimes came to public attention in 2006. So all of this put me on the back foot somewhat and left me having to piece together a story using a patchwork of sources including newspaper articles, official government press releases, the occasional passing reference in books, and of course online sources. As ever, with secondary sources, I typically prioritize Chinese language sources because, as I have said before, I find them to be more reliable and trustworthy than the English language ones, though I did make an exception when the Chinese sources seemed a bit outlandish and unbelievable. This dependence upon secondary sources brings me no joy, as they often are very contradictory in their claims, and without primary verification, I'm left having to judge their utility based purely upon the weight of evidence or gut instinct. This is the nature of the beast with Poco's story, sadly. It is unavoidable, unless we wanted to wait 20 years to publish this video. Maybe in 20 years we'll be able to update it. Whilst I was researching this piece, I noticed how opinions on the police's handling of the case extremely polarized online. No doubt it is a tricky subject, and certainly it is easy to see why many would come away from this story with a negative opinion of the police. Um, no, I think they would, this seems to be quite a competent handling of, of everything, to be honest. It was one of their own that went rogue after all. Oh, okay. Um... That's not bad police work, that's a bad man. However, I cannot say it's an opinion I share, so I'm going to be brave here and stick my neck on the line. Personally, all things considered, I think the police did a fantastic job. Yes, agreed, they're very competent. Sure, they didn't catch Poco until they shot him, but his planning of the crimes was so meticulous and his execution of them so efficient and brutal that, frankly, I don't see how they could have been expected to. Had they failed to apprehend him due to incompetence or negligence, I'd be rightly criticizing the force, but... When they did pursue every single lead to its very ends, and uniformly displayed nothing but bravery and disregard for their own safety in the face of violence, well, good job, Hong Kong police. As far as I'm concerned, yeah, I'll back that up. I think that's spot on. Finally. And of course, it wouldn't be a Hong Kong video without the traditional contextualizing disclaimer. As ever, I implore you all to remember that the cases we look at in these videos, although always extreme in nature, are in no way representative of the territory itself, which by a country mile remains one of the safest places on earth. And that is where we end today's video. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed it. If you enjoyed, please do leave a review if you're watching on YouTube, like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.